matter, in particular uh, WIMPs. And I'm going to talk to you like about the like the basic physics of WIMPs, why we uh, they are the most popular candidates, if their work or not, of experimental evidence of WIMPs, and some of alternatives to these uh, dark matter candidates. Okay, so well, let's just begin with the introduction. Uh, so basically, <clears throat> we have <clears throat> to describe our universe. Let's say at like a fundamental level, but at very different scales, we have like two standard models. Like on the very small size, like at the, yeah, like a very small scale, we have the standard model of particle physics. And this one describes uh, three out of four uh, fundamental forces in nature, with gravity being the one excluded. But that one was never the, uh, what's the word, the objective of, of the standard model. So it was completed in 2012 when they discovered the Higgs boson at the LHC. And we know that this is very successful, right? So it, it has uh, their predictions all so far seem to be correct. Well, most of them at least. Yeah, and, and we know every component of the standard model. And uh, yeah. So on the other side, on very large scales, on cosmological scales, we have this, the, the standard model of cosmology or just lambda CDM. And this one we know that describes the evolution of our universe, like starting from the Big Bang, then going through some uh, period of inflation and uh, on up to, yeah, until our times. So, and the, yeah, the main components of the the lambda CDM model are baryonic matter, which is like non-relativistic matter as we know, uh, and interacts with every day, and some dark components that we have no idea what they are, but they are appear to be necessary to to describe the universe, which are dark matter and dark energy. Except, uh, sorry for the interruptions. Uh, Shami, yeah. please switch uh, off your microphone. All yes, sir. Other people, please switch off the microphone except the speaker. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Switching off. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and from our up from observations, uh, we know that the lambda CDM model is also very like accurate. Like it has very good predictions. Uh, yeah. So the, the one question here. Yes. So. Uh, we uh, know that we mostly use lambda CDM, but uh, yeah. why so? Why lambda CDM is so good that we are believed that uh, like uh, lambda CDM is uh, very good uh, prediction from the cosmological side? Because why I'm asking? Because there, there are other options also people used to work, which is called W CDM or something like Omega CDM or something like that. Mm -hmm. So like. Why uh, lambda CDM is best rather than the other option? Well, I think it's just like from the observations, like this model has certain predictions and they fit really well with the with what's been observed. I mean, of course, it's one of its uh, <clears throat> like problems is that it relies on the existence of these dark uh, components. Mm -hmm. And of course, and yeah, let's say inflation that you, we also need that uh, period of inflation to solve this uh, problem, the horizon problem, the flatness one. But yeah, I, I mean, it's the observations that make it. So like, uh, please name few observations for the students so that they can actually check. Mm, oh, observations. Well, I think like probably like the most the, the best one is uh, like measurements and all that of the of the CMB that with yeah with like all the, the tools from the lambda CDM one can make predictions about like the oscillations in CDM like this. Uh, Oh, are you, yeah, like those oscillations that we can see there, like I, I actually cannot think of what else we can see there right now. But uh, I, as far as I can remember, 
so yeah. uh, we know that uh, like uh, it's the theoretical predictions that you have to have some dark components matter energy those that if if this is not then you can't able to conserve the whole energy of our universe this is true yes. now yeah. the thing is measure this parameter like uh, uh, you have a little bit some sort some sorts of priors like like uh, you can't directly measure omega that means the abund uh, like uh, uh, density but instead of that actually you can measure the abundance yes but from that actually you derive the value of the uh, this kind of uh, densities like dark matter density and uh, uh, dark energy density whatever yeah so doing simulations because planck as far as i know planck do the similar thing yeah yeah i think so too yeah, yeah i mean yeah but i mean but with this model you can also like uh, yeah like say about like predict the existence of the cmb like yeah. of all the large large uh, large scale structure formation mm. and the bbn the big bang nucleosynthesis also it's yeah. part of it and all of these predictions seem to be very accurate with what we've seen mm, mm, mm. yeah just just with uh, and why uh, 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 that uh, you have said that last missing piece Higgs boson because the like after LHC after 2012 Higgs boson uh, discovery is there is nothing happen more mm, I I mean not not very relevant I think uh, I mean at the LHCb people have observed certain uh, anomalies to sorry okay yeah so like there, there has been some certain anomalies, for example, in, in some uh, meson decays, like B meson decays, which are like there's certain difference there with the, say with, yeah, with the standard model prediction and what's been observed. But the, yeah, this discrepancy is very small still. It could be because of some uh, strong interactions that we do not understand completely there. It could also be new physics, but I think, uh, uh, yeah, like besides the Higgs boson, there's been no major discovery there. Uh, people were looking for supersymmetry, and people are still looking for supersymmetry. Some of yeah, some like, people uh, like supersymmetry and like uh, what it's called uh, extensions of the standard model. Like if you introduce some kind of gauge groups, you want to see that what kind of possibilities you can able to explain from there yes yeah exactly uh, here i have question so like uh, what about uh, in any any constraints from dark matter from lhc mm, yeah yeah because for example you cannot detect dark matter directly at the lhc mm -hmm. but you can uh, kind of say see it quote unquote uh through some excess of missing energy like you know that the the like yeah certain particles escape the, the detector mostly neutrinos mm -hmm. uh <clears throat> but with yeah with that missing energy one can estimate if there's some additional particle there besides the neutrinos uh but yeah and that so far i mean yeah, there are some certain constraints, for example, on, on dark matter, for example, in, in, in models like Higgs portal models or, or, or models with more Higgses, mm. where the Higgs may decay into some of these uh, new states, which later decay on dark matter. And yeah, from, from that missing energy, there are uh, several constraints. Well, one can put constraints there. You cannot observe it directly, but through this missing energy, one can tell maybe there's some particle there escaping the detectors that is not a neutrino. 
Okay, you can proceed. Uh, other people have any question you can ask. I don't need to say, uh, you can open and openly ask him if you have any questions. Yeah, please. Okay, well, if there are not questions right now, so let me continue. Proceed. So, yeah, like I'd say, but now one, yeah, like, some of these ingredients in the lambda CDM model are these dark components, which are dark energy and dark matter. And turns out that they uh, form like 95% of our universe. What we know, what we see every day, this visible matter, it's just approximately 5% of the energy density of the universe. So the nature of this, these things, like we, we need them to explain uh, what's going on, but we don't know what they are. And this is like a big open question in physics. And there's a lot of research going on, especially for dark matter, because dark energy is like more complicated. So let's put dark energy aside and let's just talk about dark matter. So for the evidence of dark matter, like there is a lot, like historically, the first one came from the rotation curves from, cer from certain galaxies. So I think like almost, yeah, like almost a hundred years ago, like last century, like this, uh, the Swiss astronomer Zwicky, he was the first one to measure uh, the velocity in the, yeah, for, for stars in, in certain galaxies. And he, he found a discrepancy be between what was uh, expected just from say simple Newtonian gravity from doing the balance of of, of this uh, gravitational force and the, and the one due to the rotation. And yeah, there's a discrepancy. Then the, the most famous observations from uh, Vera Rubin also agreed that there's, yeah, there's this discrepancy of what's expected and what's really observed. And then furthermore, I mean, later there was more evidence coming from gravitational lensing from the cosmic microwave background, and there is some more. And like I'd say, like, uh, historically, the first one came from these rotation curves, and in the figure, I hope that you can see, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of like this. So one expects that the velocity, like, in, <clears throat> for outside, yeah, in, in distant regions from the the galaxy center, the velocity would drop, uh, but it's actually kind of remains constant. Well, it's it's just not what it's uh, what's predicted. And in order to explain this, uh, well, yeah, like the, the the explanation was that okay, maybe there's more matter there that causes this. Uh, this, yeah, these gravitational effects that compensate for, for, for all that. And yeah, there's some matter there that we cannot see, but this is what's producing this discrepancy between what's observed and what's pre the predictions. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yep. uh, so, uh, well, like, uh, is there any theory or some... Uh, uh, some astrophysical uh, background using which you can actually try to match this measured thing. Mm, so you mean like uh, something else that you can do besides? No, I'm saying that uh, uh, you say that from the uh, measurement you get some discrepancy. Okay. Yeah. And the calculation shows that it goes down so, uh, up yeah. a certain point. I'm saying that is there is a possibility in the astrophysical side, in theoretical side particularly, uh, where you can actually introduce something or there are mod some modification using that you can actually try to measure this, uh, whatever you get from observation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're, the, are you referring to, you can say, okay, maybe we can modify like gravity like yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, it's yeah, not exactly. new it's it's yeah. not newtonian it's new yeah. newton plus something else yeah, yeah, yeah there's yeah there's like a lot of the detractors of dark matter which do not like that we have to include this new exotic uh matter there to explain this they say okay maybe gravity works different 
uh, but those are very well. At least the the the, the early versions of this modified gravity are. Yeah, are not, are not as uh, successful, say, as dark matter, because I think the, the problem is that you often require like different, like, uh, what do you say? Like, Abhinash, it's a request to you. Please switch off your microphone as well as your uh, video also. Your background noise is coming repeatedly. It's uh, actually, uh, he's giving a talk. He can't able to concentrate properly. Don't do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the, this modified gravity, like the problem is that you often require like kind of like a different model for, for each galaxy. So it's not something that's universal for every galaxy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there there's uh, there's that alternative that one can say, OK, maybe just gravity acts different like at these galactic scales. Yeah, like uh, people used to work on that side as well. Yeah, as far as I know. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, like, like I said, like there, there are some. Uh, well, it was, yeah, okay. So, for at this galactic scale, there's actually like a lot of issues with dark matter. That, uh, yeah, like there are some problems there that dark matter cannot quite explain, or some predictions that what can make if one considers dark matter, but the observations say something different. And that's like a lot of detractors of dark matter say, OK, but maybe it doesn't work, right? Because it, it works at very large scales, which is like one of the good things. But at these smaller scales, so there are some issues. And yeah, like uh, uh, the alternative is, OK, maybe gravity acts different. So like this modify this mon theories now, those are, I think, almost excluded. But there are other versions, like covariant versions of well, covariant modifications of GR, not just Newtonian gravity. I can understand. But do, do you know that there is a particular thing is called MOND? MOND, do you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Newtonian gra modifications of Newtonian gravity are not like that successful, but modifications yeah, so if of... You, if you just say to MOND people, they will kill you. <laughs> yeah, I know. They. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> They are very uh, what's it, stubborn sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I don't know. But like if things are not working, you have to be update yourself. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I, I'm. I yeah. Here, I would say we can just keep an open mind. It could be either of those things, but yeah. we don't have to hate. <laughs> yeah, if, if one is doing dark matter, you don't have to hate modified gravity and the other way around. It's just yeah. yeah, it's better to keep an open mind. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, anybody have any question regarding this galactic rotation curve? Any other people? Any anybody can ask any question. Don't. Okay. Yeah. Well, and. Yeah, so there is this that evidence. Somebody just okay. Please ask. Hello. We can't hear you. Can you can you pose the problem, please? Okay. As there is no question. George, you please proceed. OK, yeah, so and so going on. So there's now more evidence, like, for example, for from gravitational lensing, the like the idea is the same. We observe like these uh, clusters of galaxies and they produce certain. Yeah, they produce this lensing. And if one only takes into account the visible matter, like the stars, dust. Yeah, and so that like uh, there, George. Please yes. elaborate this word gravitational lensing because as far as I know, these guys don't know. Okay, yeah, so... Please uh, talk about lensing and please also mention that there are two types of lensing, which is weak and strong and yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, he, yeah, like he said, there, there's these two types of lensing: the strong one and the the weak one. Actually, like I'm not familiar right now with the like the difference between these two. Just, just uh, mention what gravitational lensing is. What yeah. Is so, uh, yeah. So the idea is like we for like we know like I hope we that we know that uh, gravity also like af affects like the the path where light goes through, right? So it it actually bends light. So large concentrations of masses produce like this uh, bending of light. So yeah, like, so say light coming from behind uh, certain large concentration of like a large mass concentration, like a cluster of galaxies. Uh, so yeah, the light coming from behind it, it's gonna deviate. It's not gonna follow like a straight path, right? So this is going to produce like a lensing, like in the op optical sense, that it may produce like distortions from the images behind this uh, this cluster, or multiple copies of certain galaxies or stars that are behind it. So yeah, so what we see is like the, the cluster with some copies of of what's behind it, like around it, because of this bending of the light. And if yeah, like and from what's been observed, if you want to explain that just using the galaxies, the visible matter, like the stars, dust, and whatnot, it is not sufficient to explain like this amount of lensing, like all this number of copies that are there. But it's, but yeah, but if one uh, takes into account like now this dark matter density, it actually fits really well with uh, yeah with this. Uh, distortion that, that we see with, with the lensing that is observed. And yeah, it's basically the same idea. If we just take into account visible matter, it's, yeah, it doesn't explain like all these gravitational effects. So, but if we consider like this new um, uh, density of dark matter, then it fits really well. Yeah, it's uh, now in proceedings. Very yeah. Good. Okay. So, and with the CMB, it's again like the, the general idea, but this is uh, well, it's a bit more elaborated. So, the the idea of the CMB, uh, yeah, the the evidence for dark matter coming from the CMB, it's because initially, like the the universe, is, it's like it has like an almost smooth distribution, but there are some like over dense regions here or there, like some. Uh, What's what's the word? I forgot. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like this, this uh, anisotropies. So uh, you, you want to mean that distribution of this cold and hot spots? Yes. And yeah, and, and like in these regions that that have like a little higher density of dark matter, like with all the evolution of of the universe, like expanding and cooling down. Well, these regions are gonna uh, cool. Yeah, like they're gonna collapse gravitationally because of the high concentration of mass there, and but that's just from the dark matter. But then the the baryonic matter, which is like the visible one, it's gonna follow along, and it's gonna, yeah, let's say it's gonna follow like with this collapse, but it's gonna heat because of like this the, this movement, and then it's gonna like with. It's heating and it's going to produce eventually a pressure that it's enough to compensate of uh, compensate this gravitational collapse, and it's going to kind of bounce off, right, from from being attracted to this over dense region and then bouncing off because of this pressure. And this is going to produce certain oscillations that, when we reach recombination and like these photons start streaming uh, freely, that's what we see in the CMB one can kind of see like this oscill one can measure like in the CMB these oscillations. Uh, and the let, yeah, let's say like the height of these oscillations depends on the ratio of dark matter to baryonic matter. So again, one uh, yeah from measuring this one can estimate what's the percentage of dark matter in com in comparison with the visible matter. But yeah, that's yeah, that's the general idea. And there's more evidence. Yeah. 
Answer the question, please. You ask whether the dark matter to barrier symmetry ratio uh, is that changing or is that constant? Sorry, is that changing or what? Oh, constant. The ratio of dark matter to magnetic matter. Uh, yeah. Is it uh, changing or is it a constant? No. Well, uh, I mean, it's a constant in in the sense that, uh, yeah, like the 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 dark matter density is like twenty five percent of the, uh, well, eighty percent of the of the matter density of the universe. So in that sense, it's a constant. But I I assume maybe in certain regions it can be. Uh, slightly yeah. different. Nitin have asked good question. If you uh, see the CMB plots, the uh, power spectrum plots, you will see that there are certain oscillations. In CMB yeah, yeah. plots, you see that these oscillations, uh, 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 the peak heights of these oscillations are not same. So, uh, if you measure that this ratio for different different peaks. You will get different different numbers, okay. But yeah. the thing is, uh, yeah, like I want to say that statistically, maybe there is a central value. Obviously, whatever he is saying, it's a constant. But it is out of that there is an error bar. Yeah. Okay, so is this a constant? Is uh, like the uh, according to the Big Bang theory, since the Big Bang is it a constant or what? Uh, or is it like sort of uh, um, it has sort of decayed to a constant value in the later, uh, later time? Like, um, have you uh, answer to that? Yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question? Like, I couldn't so, hear the last part. My, yeah, my question is. Uh, like uh, this ratio, the baryonic to the uh, dark matter ratio or the inverse. Yes. Uh, like, what do we say? Is this uh, the same since the Big Bang, or is it evolving since the Big Bang and it has decayed to a constant value in, let's say, past uh, billion years or so or whatever? Yeah. Uh, well, no. I mean, I don't think it's the same as Big Bang because, well, first of all, like CMB, we. Uh, like it's just from recombination, like. Before that, we're not sure what happened. Uh, so let's say it's from there. But also, like, well, at least in the WIMP sense, you start with some initial uh, dark matter density, which follows certain uh, evolution, like certain distribution, which is like you can approximate it as a Bols Boltzmann, uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. But yeah, eventually this one is gonna say fall out of equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, and it's gonna reach like a constant value. But before that, it's actually changing. Yeah, initially, it is in out of equilibrium. Then after a certain time, it will reach the equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah, so do we have any sort of uh, evidence for uh, sort of some oscillation between matter and dark matter, panionic matter and dark matter? Or are or basically my question can we interpret it as follows? Uh, like uh, are all the evidence for dark matter indirect, or do we have something more direct like dark matter to baryonic matter oscillation or something like that? Mm, well, yeah, I mean the the CMB is what gives you this. Uh, so there is certain there is certain thing is called baryon acoustic oscillation. I don't know you don't know about this one now. Have you heard about this BAO? No, sir. Yeah, so BAO actually takes care of the fact whatever you are saying. Okay. BAO is basically saying that the, this kind of oscillation is there. Okay. And it okay. is basically it's basically the part of CM. Obvious. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Proceed. Okay. <clears throat> okay, yeah, so there's there's this whole evidence that it's, yeah, like like he mentioned just now, it's kind of indirect because it all, it's all coming from these uh, gravitational effects 
because like what we measure is light and of course dark matter does not produce <clears throat> any electromagnetic radiation so we cannot observe it directly just through these gravitational effects so maybe that also answers a bit of what he was just asking about this indirect evidence uh yeah okay so like i said we have plenty of evidence and like through since uh or yeah since the observations of zwicky and later Rivera rubin there have been a lot of uh, dark matter candidates that have been proposed uh to yeah that to try and explain this uh, this mysterious component of the universe and among all of these i think the the wimps are the most uh yeah the most popular ones the most prominent ones and yeah so wimp wimp uh, stands for weakly interacting massive particle and like I said they are the most prominent dark matter candidate like their appeal comes more because uh, well they can explain relatively easily this observed dark matter abundance but they are also like well motivated from some from the theoretical point of view from these extensions of the standard model like in particular from supersymmetric extensions when you naturally get uh, a dark matter candidate, of course, given as that your SUSI model has its R parity conserved. Uh, and in this case, the lightest supersymmetric particle, the LSP, it's usually the, the, your, the dark matter candidate, which is uh, usually like a neutrally no type of particle. Hey, why, you, why you have mentioned about R parity? Oh yeah, because uh, yeah, so R parity is is some uh, symmetry that it's included often to pre let's say like to keep the the supersymmetric particles like in pairs that they do not appear just like by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, but if uh, and but uh, yeah, setting like this symmetry actually makes the yeah like the lightest supersymmetric particle stable because it cannot decay into into some other states because it's the lightest one it's kind of like the very number in the standard model that uh, makes the proton stable because it's the lightest variant so it cannot decay further into other particles uh, and it's kind of like the same idea but in one includes like uh, if yeah, like our party non-conserving interactions, then you don't have a lightest, like a stable light supersymmetric particle. And it's not longer uh, dark matter because it's not stable, so it's not long lived. And yeah, like if it was dark matter, it would eventually decay and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have the abundance that we see today. Yeah, and like the another appeal is that they actually can be observed like on experiments on Earth. Uh, I mean, this is a feature that it's also shared with other dark matter candidates, but uh, let's say that detecting WIMPs is easier than detecting some other dark matter candidates. So, and the idea behind WIMPs is that they are produced like at the origin of the universe, like through reheating or like whatever mechanism it's out there and they are originally in, in in well in the case of WIMPs they are in thermal equilibrium with this primordial bad and, and, and the standard model so this means that they have interactions with the standard model that are of course like large enough to keep this thermal equilibrium so you you said that during reheating it might be possible that dark matter candidates are generated Yes. So, I'm saying that, do you know the mechanism exactly? You know, yeah, from, from reheating? Yeah. Well, it's uh, like, I'm not, not exactly, but like what's, well, it's just, uh, okay, again. Yeah, like from inflation that we, like if we have, one has like this inflaton field, uh, once it, it, it starts decaying like in the potential it goes through like this uh, vacuum and starts oscillating mm -hmm. like these oscillations uh, are what produce like this uh yeah the, this reheating that it's like the inflaton is decaying into everything else mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and so if dark matter is coupled to this uh, inflaton, then it's of course during this oscillation period, this is going to decay into standard model and dark matter. Yeah. Yeah, and in, for example, yeah, like as this in the case of WIMPs, since everything is in thermal equilibrium, then these couplings of standard model and dark matter to inflaton are usually like the same or like same order. But if one wants to achieve, well, or not achieve thermal equilibrium, say that this, these two, the dark matter and the standard model are initially not in thermal equilibrium, and has, one has to include like different couplings to this input and, and make up things a bit more complicated. But yeah, like originally they are uh, like the same. So this is how one gets thermal equilibrium. Yeah. And so like, yeah. So on this equilibrium, okay. like ask this question particularly, because this thing we used to say many, many times in literature, but uh, uh, unfortunately, if you look into the literature, nobody have explained the, properly this particular phenomena. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, uh, yeah, one of my tasks right now uh, to uh, explore this area properly because the, uh, the how this out of equilibrium physics is important and why at the end it go why and how it goes to the equilibrium during the heating and then at the end uh, that will generate the dark matter candidate these things are we used to say a lot but they are, we don't actually calculate or show properly so, yeah i think oh so sorry this is like one 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 of the thing i am actually uh, these days are very much interested in yeah, actually, yeah, I, I agree that a lot of people yeah. mention it, but but you never see like explicit calculation. And I think it may be due to the fact that there's like a lot of like this perturbative uh, scheme, like there are some uh, nonlinear effects that sometimes are very hard to. Yeah, I mean, you cannot you cannot do it like analytically. One has to use. Uh, that's uh, why that's why uh, this uh, Orko Prabhu, who is actually joining the uh, group meeting right now, Orko Prabhu, me and few of us actually started working on this out of equilibrium aspects of cosmology from the mm. last year. So they are yeah, yeah. actually trying to understand that how this can be done. And we found from literature, few people have already done. So yeah, one, yeah. one of them is uh, Professor Daniel Bauman from uh, Amsterdam. Nick F. Yeah. Adam, he's actually trying to interested in this type of questions. And uh, we found that maybe a lot of condensed matter techniques, which we actually use because we actually use the equilibrium techniques still now. But if, yeah. you, if you're really interested in the non-equilibrium stuff, then we found that, uh, yeah, various non-equilibrium techniques may be very, very, very important, which people used to uh, use in the context of uh, this condensed matter physics. So, yeah, okay. So it's, it's very interesting, actually. That's why I have posed this question. So you can yeah. actually join on this type of calculations with us as well, because you have expertise on dark matter, then it can be very interesting, actually. Yeah, actually, I was going to mention that I also have like work a bit and like in the context of dark matter, in, in possible possible uh, out of equilibrium dark matter, yeah. like initially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Proceed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and then like I was saying, like the equilibrium, it's uh, it's kept with these conversions of dark matter into standard model particles. Usually, like these are two to two processes, uh, at least in the WIMP case. And these conversions, like from dark matter, of course, that's still like at certain temperature, it's what keeps everything in equilibrium. But of course, we know that the universe is expand, well, expands. This also means that it's cooling down. And this process, it's, it's kind of, it's shut down because eventually, uh, yeah, like these conversions are not going to be efficient. 
and this is going to produce this uh, dropout of equilibrium and it's going to make that the dark matter density freezes or almost freezes in time and then it keeps a constant value and to yeah like so this is just on words but to understand this like better it's yeah what it's used is the Boltzmann equation so one can uh, study like the evolution of the dark matter density so in the Friedman so Robertson book it's, it's a Boltzmann equation in FRW universe yes yeah, I was, yeah, that was just going to say that, that uh, in the Friedman Robertson Walker uh, universe, then one can, yeah, one starts writing the, the Boltzmann equation and after doing some, uh, uh, some math, some calculations, one reaches this uh, equation that I hope that you can see in slide 11. And it's, uh, yeah, the Boltzmann equation, uh, the integra integrated one. So this n of uh, chi is the the number yes, density the of dark matter. One more question: This yes. sigma v is the collision cross section, as far as I know. Yes. So why we have to take this average? Probably this is the thermal average. Yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, like once, why we have to take take this thermal average, particularly? Mm, well, the, 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 this thermal average comes from the, well, there are, of course, some assumptions uh, behind the writing this equation, the derivation of this equation. One is that, like, the, the products of, of these annihilation processes that we are considering, like, go quickly into equilibrium uh, and all that stuff. And this, this no, cross-section... Hey, why you are, uh, why I am asking this? Like... Uh, can we uh, relax this assumption and try that how the non-equilibrium physics contribute here? Oh yeah, we, we can, but this uh, usually this uh, so the, this form actually what what I was saying yeah like one assumes that these products go, go quickly into equilibrium back into equilibrium, yeah. but it may not be the case. So instead of like having this n square, one is gonna have. Uh, like yeah, like some product there of of this. Uh, do you know the, that anybody have tried that kind of calculation? I do actually, but I actually I don't have the slide here. But maybe I can uh, can send you like yeah, something. I, yeah, you just send me. Then maybe we can think of something because it can be a nice thing if we can able to show. Something. Yeah. And, yeah, and for example, this usually go leads to like a uh, couple, like not just one Boltzmann equation, but but two or more that have to be solved. Like it's a system of equations that needs to be solved. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but here, in, like with everything in equilibrium, this is just like the evolution of the number density, which is just the integrate the yeah, like the the space. No, sorry, the yeah, the phase phase space uh, density integrated over all this phase space. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the assumption here is that the, the well, it's in an isotropic homogeneous universe, so it only, it's only going to depend on the energy and time. And the equilibrium one can be approximated uh, through Bo Maxwell Boltzmann. Yeah. Yeah, because one can assume that uh, when the, when the dark matter freezes out, it's going to be non-relativistic. So yeah. one can make the approximation. But I remember reading some paper when you can actually use the full uh, uh, Bose-Einstein or uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution, and the difference in calculations is not that uh, large. It's very small. So, so here it's, you have written something called GKI, which is the relativistic number degree, degrees of freedom. So, yes. how you supply that number? Mm -hmm. Oh well, it depends if if it's a, if this particle chi is a fermion. I can't hear you, George. Oh, it depends if it's a fermion or a boson. This uh, chi particle. No. So if it's why I'm asking, uh, as you say that n chi is evolving with time, 
Jikai also itself evolving with time. Sorry, I it's I couldn't hear. No, I'm saying that uh, your n of chi, which is the number density of the dark matter yes. particle, which is time dependent. Yes. But once you yes. write it in terms of this uh, phase space distribution, you have written G chi mm -hmm. uh, out of the integral because it is not dependent on the momentum p. Oh, yeah. But I want to say that G chi is basically evolving with time as well because in different, different epoch, your number of relativistic degrees of freedom is not fixed actually. Yeah, but here is just the, the the degrees of freedom of the particles, not the. I think you're thinking about this, uh, like the G star or the G star S. Yeah, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it is that, not the same. No, no. This is just the like the number of degrees of freedom of that particle. Like if it's a if it's a boson, it's just one or. Uh, oh, it's one. it's just a number. Yeah, it's just. Well, one or three by two, I think. Okay. If, okay. if it's boson or fermion. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, and and then, so this just this all comes from like say like the thermal uh, properties of all this, and what it's gonna encapsulate like all the particle physics properties of the model once once you study. It's gonna be like this sigma v, that is the thermally average cross section, and it's defined. Uh, well, like you can see there, like at some ugly integral, but it can also be so approximated. You have, written, you have written this in terms of Mandel's term variable s. Yes, but this can be approximated as instead of some integral, some uh, series of b, where b is the um, the velocity, the relative velocity of the center of mass, or okay. Okay. yeah. Yeah, and this is what's going to encapsulate. So if one wants to study some uh, some model, this is the quantity that usually uh, so one model. You can have able to calculate this k one root s by t. I think. Yeah, that those are just uh, uh, okay. k one. Those is are just be vessel functions. Vessel sorry. functions of first kind and second kind. Right? Yes. Exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, from the model, you can able to calculate sigma. Yes, sigma is what one is going to count. Yeah. And then you put it, and you can able to calculate the uh, thermal average cross section. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now I got it. Yeah. And this is yeah, like I said, this is the quantity that that one uh, is looking for when studying some dark matter model because this is what's gonna encapsulate that, all the properties that it has. Okay. And yeah, so and the 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 Boltzmann equation can be written can be written in uh, in terms of these new variables, which is the commoving mo uh, number density and this x, which it's just the coefficient of the dark matter mass over temperature. So that the, I mean, so this is just you want to write this thing in terms of co-moving thing because you want to express it in terms of dimensionless units. Yeah, but also like the this uh, kind of um, what's it factors out like the the terms due to the expansion of the universe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you yes. don't need to care about all those things here. Yeah, so one can just study like this co-moving co volume. And, and, and this yeah. S, the S is the entropy density. Yes. Yeah, here it's different S. Sorry, I should mention that. Yeah, and yeah, and, and well, with this uh, equation, it's kind of easier to uh, to study the evolution of dark matter. And I will show you right now. And in yeah, like the standard calculation shows that the, the dark matter abundance, the relic abundance, this omega H square. It's gonna. It's yeah. Like generally, in some in any generic wind model, it's gonna be inversionally proportional to this uh, thermally average cross section that we that I showed before. So that's also the importance of it because with this quantity, one can start estimating the 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 relic abundance that in in the model given by that model. And this is usually going to be like a function of the mass of the dark matter and its couplings. 
So that's how one can uh, put constraints on, on, on these parameters from this observed relic abundance because there's like this direct uh, relationship. And yeah, and so like the attractive feature is feature of, of WIMPs, dark matter WIMPs, is that if one for a particle like around of some GBs, like 100 GBs up to a few TVs, and cross sections that are around the same size of the ones uh, associated with the weak interactions, uh, they can reproduce very nicely this uh, they observe relic abundance of dark matter that has been observed but first by the WMAP uh, uh, yeah both WMAP satellite and more recently by Planck yeah and yeah well this the 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 fact that this can be done like I said with these cross sections and these masses is what's known as the WIMP miracle. Uh, uh, error bar in the, uh, this abundance. This is how much error bar? It's uh, one sigma or two sigma? No, I think it's just like one sigma or something like that. Okay. And uh, what about uh, the constraint from uh, this particle data group PDG? Uh, whoa, whoa. So why Sorry. I'm asking because this is the constraint from the cosmology, actually. And yes. The particle da data group also gives some constraint on the dark matter abundance. Is that both of them are uh, overlapping or there is some discrepancy between both of them? Mm, you know I, don't, this? I don't know. Well, what do you, I don't know. Uh, sorry, I don't know what you refer to with the PDG. Yeah, PDG actually given some constraint on uh, dark matter density. Why I'm saying the, those who are doing particle physics, they actually uh, strongly take that, uh, strongly believe on that data. Okay. So I'm saying yeah. that uh, b this, uh, uh, b b b what is this? This uh, abundance uh, getting from yeah. WMAC and Planck, well, whether this is actually consistent or uh, like uh, what are, uh, is there any common overlapping region between the two measurements? That's that's why I'm asking. You mean from WMAP and Planck? Not WMAP Planck. Well, I'm saying that WMAP Planck with PDG. Yes. Oh, well, I don't know because from I think from the PDG and all that it comes. I mean, it gives constraints on the masses, and I assume that this. You can associate these some masses to the to the relic abundance okay. in some generic uh, wind model. I mean, you can, yeah, you can uh, make a yeah, like take a general approach and use some uh, cal a, uh, yeah, like generic quantities here, like sigma b. Say, okay, this is around. Uh, I think the 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 one that it's usually that it uses, uh, I forgot the number, it's 10 to the minus 26 uh, centimeters square per second, or sec second to the minus one or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and with certain masses, uh, you can estimate with this uh, relationship between the cross section and the, the relic abundance. So maybe it's because of that. But I think, but Planck and WMAP don't give any information about masses or anything. This is just the abundance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and with, and yeah, like, and the, this is what, when with every model, one tries to achieve to, yeah, to reproduce this, this number with the, the, this cross sections. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and like I said, like with if one writes everything like in this moving number density, then it's kind of easier to understand the evolution. And like in this plot, it's like the uh, yeah, like the the standard solution for the WIMP. So this these there's some dotted line. I hope that you can see that it's the like the darker one. It's the equilibrium density, which is like a M Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So the dark matter has some initial uh, density here and it, it follows this distribution 
because everything is at equilibrium. This means that the annihilation rate, which is the, the product of, of this uh, cross section, this the thermally average cross section times number density, it's way larger than the Hubble factor. That means that these conversions are efficient to keep and they keep the the density in equilibrium but then of course the universe goes down uh, and then this annihilation uh, rate becomes uh, around the same order of the of the Hubble factor and then that's when the the dark matter falls out of equilibrium because the interactions that we're keeping in, in everything in balance are no longer efficient uh, so it falls out of equilibrium and it remains constant because it's no longer annihilating. So yeah, so the idea is that we have like these dark matter particles that are annihilating like in, in pairs, but say like the, the universe starts expanding, so these particles like find it harder to find uh, one another to annihilate or some, yeah, and because they don't have like enough energy now. So so these annihilations like cease to be efficient and so the dark the density freezes and that's the what happens here around uh when this the the ratio of the annihilation uh, ratio and the annihilation rate sorry and the hubble factor is around one and once this annihilation rate is way smaller than the hubble factor then it's like i say it they, it's no longer annihilating, so it's 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 constant the, the density, okay. and it's no longer following equilibrium values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's like I said, like the the general feature is that also this happens when dark matter is non-relativistic. Mm -hmm. uh, that means that the the temperature is. Uh, yeah, the, the the mass is way larger than the temperature of the of the of the dark matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So so that's the, the sorry. So that's the general like yeah that's in general what what's going on like the thermal history of WIMPs. So. So yeah, so in the universe, like this happened. Well, this already happened. So the dark matter abundance is, I mean, yeah, it's already uh, set to what we see today, but dark matter is still out there. And uh, like I say, like the appeal of these wimps is that we one can de uh, detect them like in experiments here and there, but there are some other ways of detecting it. And uh, yeah, so there are indirect searches, direct searches, and uh, collider, uh, yeah, searches at colliders. That's something that we, I mentioned before, that yeah. what cannot, one cannot observe dark matter directly at colliders, but you can uh, maybe tell if it's there from the missing energy that one observed. Like it's being produced there. Of course, it escapes the detectors, but there's some missing energy. And this is like this diagram is nice because it kind of represents like all these searches, like depending on the direction of the line is a, it's a different kind of search. Like indirect searches are in, uh, is this in the case where there's like an overdense region of dark matter, like these satellite galaxies, these dwarf satellite galaxies. And this, since it's an overdense region, there may be more annihilations of dark matter going on there, which can produce, for example, some excess on gamma rays observed. Because, I mean, these are going to, of course, annihilate into standard model particles, which later decay in some other things, like photons or I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, like uh, this produce some signals, like signals like gamma rays uh, that can be observed. And the direct one is the like uh, this experiment in there. Basically, some detectors that are buried underground to keep them from away from other possible sources of radiation. Uh, and basically, it's they are literally just waiting there for a dark matter particle to come, uh, like say crash with one of the nucleons in the detector, which are often made of xenon or 
or some other materials. So this, uh, well, it's going to scatter with the new cleanser and it's going to deposit some energy. And this energy is what they measure. And of course, this is, uh, this can be uh, estimated with the uh, as function of the mass of the of the dark matter particle and its couplings, mm -hmm. and and this is what gives you bound on the dark matter uh, mass, because uh, well so far there have been no signals in a very large, uh, in a yeah in a wide range of this parameter space, uh, because yeah there have been been any signals, uh, so. Yeah, so this is actually like the direct limits, I, I think, are the more uh, constraining ones. Because they, um, yeah, so here you can see like one of the plots, the, the famous plots uh, of this direct detection experiment. So what we have is like the the WIMP, uh, the scattering cross section as a function of the mass. And like this green region that you can see, I hope it's the excluded parameter space. And this is already an old plot. I think the, the newer ones are even more, uh, yeah, there's a larger parameter space that has been excluded because there have been no signals there. Uh, yeah, and like there's this new plot from the, the more, the newer experiments like, and the ones that are more precise, like the LUX and Xenon one, one ton. And yeah, like so far there have been any signals. So this this one can discard like a, yeah, like all these cross sections associated with certain masses. And like this in particular, like from direct detection, this uh, these limits are what uh, kind of have like the community a bit worried because people would expect like maybe there has that there have been some signal already. But this, so since the parameter space becomes uh, more and more constrained, then there's a lot of people have started to think, okay, maybe WIMPs are not, <clears throat> like dark matter is not a WIMP. So this has led to the exploration of scenarios beyond like the standard WIMP, or even beyond that, uh, to try to explain the nature of dark matter. So yeah, like I said, there has been no signal that we can say, okay, there's some particle here with this mass that could be dark matter. So there's nothing like that. And this has, yeah, this has uh, started like a lot of research in the direction of like beyond the standard wind. And like a lot of these alternatives are usually, uh, well, some of these are one can, one can get them by, for example, relaxing some assumptions when deriving the Boltzmann equation for for the dark matter, or like yeah, relax or relaxing some other of the assumptions that are there, and uh, yeah, so there are a lot of these can uh, these candidates now that are like beyond the standard WIMP. For example, the FIMPs that are very popular right now that is, they stand for feebly interacting massive particles, and the idea here in FIMPs is that. Uh, well, I'll just explain right now, but uh, okay, yeah, there, there's that. There are some things that call super WIMPs, there are co-annihilations uh, or secluded dark matter scenarios, and those I have worked a, a little before, so I will, I can explain just in a second more. And there are like candidates that are like way completely different from the, from the WIMP. For example, axions that are also very popular there are like primordial black holes, which are not even particles anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that they, those are like more in the category of like these machos, like the massive uh, astrophysical comp compact halo objects. Uh, and or and of course, there's the, the possibility that there's not actually like a dark matter particle. It could be just like a geometric feature, for example, in these modified gravity theories. Okay. Yeah. And just uh, I'll explain like briefly a couple of these. What is this mimetic theory? Oh, that's a very interesting one. It's like in the in the in the spirit, for example, of this of uh, this F of R theories, when uh, one can write like this. Uh, yeah, like this 
uh, action for gravity. That's Einstein Hilbert plus something more, like mm -hmm. some function of, of the Ricci scalar. Mm -hmm. uh, but one can, so that's written in some frame, right? Like the Jordan frame, I think. Mm -hmm. And one can make some, some transformation and put it in the Einstein frame. And what in say it's like a duality, like what in one universe was uh, this 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 universe with a bit a little more complicated gravity than the Einstein one. In this universe, in the other in the other universe, it's gonna be in the Einstein frame. You can actually supply the dark. Yeah, in the other one, it's gonna be like Einstein Hilbert plus some scalar field, ah, and it's like I got it. I got it. Yeah, and it's like the, the the same, like similar idea that one can include some uh, degree, some scalar degree of freedom within the metric. So my metric is going to be like an effect, effective metric and this uh, scalar. But without introducing the matter by hand, you are actually yeah. supplying through geometry. Yes. Yeah. Again. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's just like this. Uh, conformal degree of freedom that one can like extract exactly. exactly yeah and it's uh it's not going to be a particle it's just going to be like this geometric feature from this uh different gravity from that the einstein hilbert one and i that one i it's very interesting uh yeah and so like these alternatives for example the secure dark matter scenario it's actually i think one of the simplest ones because instead of dark matter interacting directly with the standard model, there's a new mediator particle that is not standard model. So the, the dark matter decays into mediator particles that all later decay into standard model ones. So now it's like a two step, but the 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 advantage of this is that it kind of divert uh, yeah, the the diagram that I showed before, I think, was slide 11 or something. Mm -hmm. Or uh, just check. No, sorry, 15. Okay. Uh, it's uh, like these diagrams now are divorced because the one for the direct detection experiments mm -hmm. now it's going to be a different one than the than the annihilation ones, which are also the ones that said the the relic abundance. So be, because mm -hmm. now the, the relic abundance is going to be set by annihilations of dark matter into mediator particles. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, if the hierarchy of masses allows that. But uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, yeah. So basically, now these are these are two different sectors that are connected by this mediator particle, which is also a new particle. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and depending on the like the, the size of these couplings and uh, yeah, the, the these couplings, maybe these are not uh, cannot be detected that easily, like on the these experiments on Earth. So this is kind of like cheating because one can uh, the thing is like okay, we're avoiding like this experimental constraints, but one can still explain like the the observed abundance, but through different annihilation channels. Uh, yeah, so that that's one scenario. Then the the FIMPS one, which is uh, well, it's similar but not really to the WIMP one because now instead of starting with some uh, initial density non-zero, it's actually a very a neg negligible initial density or could be zero, and the dark matter is actually produced. It's not produced like through reheating, but it's produced through the decay of some particle in the standard model bat. It could be standard model particles or something something new as well. So the decay of this particle, uh, again, eventually becomes efficient in the evolution of the universe. And it starts decaying in dark matter, but even, but also the, the density of this decaying particle, it's going to become suppressed also because of the expansion of the universe. And it's gonna so once that it's it's suppressed, like it's gonna stop decaying, and this is what's gonna freeze the value of the of the dark matter density. And this process is what's called freeze in, like in opposition of the freeze out process. And like this is one plot that I made quickly 
to show um, like the difference, right? So now the dotted line is the the equilibrium density of some particle. Well, like of the would be dark matter particle, but if it were in equilibrium initially. But instead here it starts with like a very small density or like zero density, but it starts being produced through these decays. So it starts increasing, but once uh, this Boltzmann separation comes into play, then it remains constant. So it's like a different production mechanism, but it's kind of like similar Boltzmann equation, except that the uh, like the the y square that was there, if you remember, it's now zero. So it's like an easier equation mm -hmm. to solve. And that's one of the alternatives that's also kind of popular now. And like the another one that it's also very popular and then I find very interesting is this one of axions. So the axions also have the appeal that uh, they are, they also appear in extensions of the standard model, but in particular like in string theory. Like in string theory, there's a plethora of axions, like in a wide range of uh, mass scales. Uh, and yeah, so the, the 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 characteristics of the axion is that well, originally they were proposed as the solution to the strong CP problem, and they are like the pseudo number Boltzmann boson of some U one symmetry that's been broken. Oh. Uh, but they can also like be explained like dark matter if they have like certain masses, of course, and uh, yeah, so the idea is kind of like similar with, uh, for example, like in inflation. So one has the axion field and some non-perturbative uh, effects, uh, like in the theory, are going to produce like a, an effective potential from my action. And this one is going to like have like a similar, well, this is one mechanism of producing like the, the, the axion dark matter. The the action goes through this potential and like it starts like rolling down like the slope and then starts oscillating like around the vacuum. Uh, and these oscillations are what are gonna produce like some local energy density that does not decay and it kind of acts like a non-relativistic matter. So yeah, so and they form like a kind of this condensate that also have like, for example, they have like very nice uh, implications, for example, in the context in context of gravitational waves, because there's the possibility that if dark matter is made of axions and some of these axions are like, say, uh, orbiting around some black hole, some cleaning black hole, then there's uh, this effect of super radiance that it's going to produce uh, gravitational waves that could be detected in the future. Yeah. But also, that these axions can also be detected here on Earth, but the experiments are uh, a bit different. Uh, but there are some, some going on at, as we speak. Uh, in, in particular, this AVMX, which is, I think, was, yeah, it's one of the larger ones. Uh, yeah, so the and these experiments are like this like resonating chamber. So basically the these axions are gonna produce photons. Uh and like these of these photons are as are what are observed, and that's how well we can tell maybe there's an axion there. Yeah. So and this is these are some of the possible alternatives. Of course, there are way more. Uh yeah. So I'm just going to finish now. Um, yeah, well, like I said initially, like the, this nature of dark matter is like one of the big open questions in cosmology and also in particle physics. And even though we have like a lot of candidates, like like and the one, the most popular one, which are the WIMPs, uh, we haven't observed any of them. So this has led to exploration of these scenarios like beyond the standard WIMPs or even beyond the particle physics uh, context. And uh, yeah, and, and a lot of this actually sound promising, but there's a lot of work to do still. I mean, it could be, literally it can be anything. 
Yeah, it's yeah. nice uh, that you have given a overview on the whole thing. So uh, whoever present uh, already, like Orko and other people, please uh, ask any question if you have anything in your mind. Yeah, I hope everything was clear. And if not, please ask questions. Yeah, he had actually presented in a very good way, not very mathematical. It's like people can understand the things properly. Orko, you have any question? No, sir. And uh, other people I couldn't even understand. Abhinash? Uh, uh, sir, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing a talk like the dark matter, like properly. So uh, I don't have like much of knowledge, but uh, this was like smooth. I, I, I got to know much about dark matter. So it was a good talk. I don't have any particular question, but I enjoyed the talk. That's, yeah, that's it was, all, it, all it, I'm really I, good I talk, really. So that's why I have uh, Okay. 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 Uh, it was. It was nice. And uh, who are the other people? There are two other people as well. I didn't know who who got them. Uh, whatever. Amlan. Um, Amlan. Amlan and Ujjwal. Yes, sir. It was very nice talk. It was. I enjoyed it a lot. It was. You just ask if any question if you have something in your mind. Yeah, anything. No. Or no, I don't have if, if you have any problem to ask right now, I will if, it, get so back. If, it is, if it is very confidential, you can't ask in front of me. You can write to him as well because he is the group member. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Joel, you can also okay. do that. Okay, let's thank George. Thank George. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I cannot I cannot hear anything. I cannot hear anything. Ujjal is saying Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, okay. what is modification of gravity, please? Yeah. Please uh, explain what is the modification of gravity. Oh well, yeah. So the the idea behind that is that you instead of having like the the gr the Einstein Hilbert action, you have like more terms. Uh, yeah. So th that's gonna produce like different. So we actually introduce uh, uh, this Einstein gravity through Einstein Hilbert action through the term called Ricci scalar. Instead yes. of that, if you have some more higher order terms in R, as well as other tensors like Ricci tensor, Ricci okay. whatever, Riemann tensor, then those modifications are usually known as the uh, uh, modified gravity. Okay. So basically, uh, gauss yes, gravity, uh, new massive gravity, they yeah, all I, are I, like this. Yeah. Is it is it similar to the logarithmic of corrections? Logarithmic correction. Uh, yeah, what what corrections? What do you mean by logarithmic correction? Where, where you see the log here? Oh I have something my just the questions means uh, I have uh, working in a project in logarithmic correction of gravity. No, this is not a logarithmic correction. No. The modifications of gravity called the modified gravity. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Instead of using the, the this Einstein Hilbert, you just mm. input more contribution and trying to see. That what is the consequences? Mostly people introduce to explain dark matter, dark energy, even if to explain sometimes inflation as well. Okay, sir. Thank you. Don't thank me. Thank God. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, you have like more terms, and then that produces. But you like the one thing is that you can see that as different gravities of universe but then you make this 
transformation of frames. And then you see it as gravity in our universe plus something else. Like in this case would be like a scalar field with certain potential. And yeah, that's going to act like a effective dark matter. Yeah. But it's not a particle. It's just like it's yeah, it's within like the degrees of freedom of the metric. So it's just a geometric feature. It's not. Yeah, and for example, like a lot of the detractors of dark matter are like, well, may, we don't have to introduce anything new. Maybe it's just we have to modify gravity, which I think it's, I mean, it's equally valid, but. Okay, so it's very nice. And George, please communicate with Rajorshi about the work. Yeah, yeah, I've been talking to him. Like, I'm and just trying to... Please actually inform in the next week whatever uh, be the progress you guys have. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm just trying to finish the calculation I'm doing so I can, like, uh, share with him. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. And Orko Prabhu also inform me about the this work, whatever you were doing. Okay. And other people who are, I have removed everybody's name, those who are not working. Please try to uh, report me, otherwise I will not uh, like do work with you completely. You have to communicate with me. And Ujjal, uh, Ujjal please contact Rajoshi as well as George because both of you are doing the same problem. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, Radu, okay, sir. George, John, they are working together in a project here. Yeah. Omlan, please talk to me sometime once you. And uh, like I have introduced uh, this uh, Shona, you, Shornabo. Yes, sir. And a few more people in this quantum Brownian motion problem. Okay. So you guys, please. Okay, sir. Okay, you, okay sir. Please talk to each other. Otherwise, how this can going to be happen? I can't able to track every time. Yes, sir. You have to. Yes, sir. Yes, what sir. Is the I I am just talking to him uh, this uh, today. I I was just talking to him. Uh, we will work together now. No, no. That you have to do from long. Right now you are doing. You are already late. Okay. Anyways, uh, like. Okay. Now, from now, you have to do this. And George, please inform me in the next. Yes, week. sir. Yes, yeah, I will. Yeah, because uh, seventh, I am leaving for Canada. Okay, so mm -hmm. up to seven, eight, I am not available. From ninth, I will be available. But yeah, like uh, in that case, your time zone and my time zone will be almost same. Yeah. Uh, they will uh, actually like. With India, it will be hugely different. So yeah. they have to, uh, yeah, communicate me in a proper time. So yeah. uh, I'm very sorry that I've like actually asked you to give a talk in the very early morning. But no, you have no, given an excellent talk that I have to say. And yeah, hopefully you. you will give much good talk in later days. Yeah, sure. Okay. So this is the thing you actually do. You have given the introduction. Now, later, I will ask to give a talk on something, whatever you are doing right now with me. Maybe the infinite derivative gravity theories. OK? Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, now I'm thinking I sh maybe I should have included a couple of slides of this non-equilibrium effect. Yeah. Uh, maybe next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. See you guys then. Yep. See you. Bye. Bye.